Welcome everyone to the second session of the Cattle Centre Conference 2022. My name is Dr. Tristan Harley and I'm an affiliate of the Cattle Centre for International Refugee Law and also a teaching fellow in the Faculty of Law and Justice at UNSW Sydney. At the commencement of this session, I would like to acknowledge the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land where I am currently based. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. In this session today, we'll be discussing one of the most significant issues to emerge in international refugee law and policy in recent years, namely the push to enhance the meaningful participation of refugees in decision-making processes. Around the world, this push has been led by new refugee-led led networks and organizations who have harnessed the mantra, nothing about us without us, and have made strong moral demands for the inclusion of refugees and their chosen representatives in decision-making processes that affect them. This advocacy has also prompted some shift in international refugee law and policy. Most notably, in December 2018, 181 member states of the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Global Compact on Refugees, which recognises in paragraph 34 that responses are most effective when they actively and meaningfully engage those they are intended to protect and assist. The Compact reflects a commitment from states, albeit non-binding, to pursue participatory projects when designing responses to refugee displacement. However, it provides very little guidance as to how the meaningful participation of refugees should be pursued. So what has been done since 2018 to provide clarity and meaningful reform to this commitment? How are governments, refugee-led organisations and others engaging with the legitimate claims of refugees to be heard in representative political processes? And what are the opportunities and barriers that remain? Today, I'm delighted to be joined by four panellists who are at the forefront of change when it comes to realising commitments towards meaningful refugee participation around the world. Joining us today, we have Najiba Wazafadolst, who is the Executive Director of the Asia-Pacific Network of Refugees, the preeminent refugee-led network in the Asia-Pacific region. Najiba is also a co-founder of the Global Refugee-Led Network and is a founding member of the Global Independent Refugee Women Leaders. We are also joined today by Mustafa Alio, who is co-managing director of RSEAT, which stands for Refugees Seeking Equal Access at the Table. Mustafa has been working for several years to increase refugee inclusion in global policy making tables and in 2019 became the first ever refugee advisor to the Canadian delegation during the United Nations meetings. Alongside Najibra and Mustafa, we are also joined by Sana Mustafa Alio. Sana is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Asylum Access and is, in her own words, a movement leader in the forced displacement sector and a feminist human rights activist fighting against systems of oppression. In recent years, Sana has been at the forefront of the fight for self-representation. And our fourth panelist today is Fiona Whiteridge, who is the General Manager of for Refugee and Migration Services for Immigration New Zealand. In that role, Fiona is responsible for leading and managing New Zealand's humanitarian international obligations and commitments to refugees and asylum seekers for New Zealand. I'm going to ask each of our four panellists about the progress that has been made in relation to catalyzing refugee participation, and we'll also ask them to reflect upon persistent barriers and next steps. Towards the end of the session, there will be an opportunity for our panellists to respond to questions from the audience. So I encourage you to post in the Q&A section of the Zoom, should you wish to ask a question. Sana, if I may start with you. In 2018, you published a powerful article in the New Humanitarian, where you stated that meaningful refugee participation requires a rethink in the international humanitarian support and development landscape. We must uproot the traditional top-down structure of humanitarian aid and initiate a participatory bottom-up approach to refugee policy. Refugees must be given a seat at the table to participate in existing conversations about refugee policy and empowered to create their own spaces. Since the publication of your article, Stana, what progress do you think has been made towards meaningful refugee participation? 
To what extent has Exylum Access and other initiatives that you've been involved in worked towards this change? Awesome, thank you so much, Tristan, uh, for the question and thanks for everyone for joining us in all different parts of the world and for um, creating the space for this conversation. Um, you know, when when you sent me the question and I was like, wow, I said that in 2018, um, I think I've been, <laughs> we've been saying it and people before us have been demanding, making this demand for decades before even I, I said it again. So I wanna acknowledge all the efforts that um, other people before us have done towards demanding more, uh, the right for self-representation and meaningful participation. And I would I, I was happy to reflect on that question and thinking of really what ha, what has been done ever since and did, how much did we move um, towards this goal and this demand and ask and I would say progress has been made and I uh, I think in other questions we'll be talking about um, maybe still like barriers and resistance but for this specific kind of uh, question I want to say that you know everything you mentioned like you mentioned the GRF and the pledge around it and I think that's a progress towards that we mentioned also how Mustafa is part of the UK Canadian delegation and just the promotion of refugee delegates on with number of um, governments to uh, with their delegations to UNHCR that's a huge progress that has been made uh, and on the global level at least um, I want to acknowledge, not give too much acknowledge, acknowledgement, but acknowledge that, you know, the GRF, for example, had um, around uh, 70 uh, refugee representatives, um, and that's historic, I mean, ironically historic, but it's like that fine line of acknowledgement, but also like seriously, we're acknowledging this, but I'm going to acknowledge that, you know, a meeting of 3,000 people about refugees that usually would have, been, would have been completely done without refugees, or maybe with one or two um, inspirational stories included over 70 refugee delegates and representative. And I think that's, you know, a starting ground. Um, I also want to acknowledge that what some of the progress that has been made about that, and I will talk also on the global systematic level, you know, UNHCR finally dropping persons of concern terminology in the way they describe us. And I think language matters and that is a victory. Uh, and it has really come as a result of the advocacy and the messages of so many uh, refugee led groups and initiatives. And finally, you know, the UNHCR as, a, as an institution has listened and dropped that really problematic language. So I wanna acknowledge that as well. I also want to acknowledge that the progress has been made um, has been made because of so many efforts of refugee led groups and movements. You know, as a founding member as well from the GRN or, you know, with our seat and now with the resourcing refugee leadership initiative, there are, I mean, change has been made also because of that organized efforts amongst persons of forced displacement and kind of being persistent around the, the demand. And we pursued that differently, you know, like some of us decided to focus on government delegations and others like now with the resourcing refugee leadership initiative, we are focusing on two things, the mindset shifting and direct resources to refugee led organizations. So a progress has been made is that we have unlocked just in the last one year and a half, just through our initiative, it, over $11 million to refugee-led organizations. And I think, you know, resourcing participation and resourcing the movement is part of shifting power back to the community so they can actually be meaningfully included and can afford, you know, be engaging in these processes. And so we decided to focus, for example, on resourcing participation. And that's only our effort within really the Resourcing Refugee Leadership Initiative. And there has been number, I don't have the number of other found, found foundations and, and donors who've come along and also been resourcing other refugee-led groups. And I, and I say that as important because in 2018, that demand was literally to like, can we just be in the room? And can we be compensated maybe for like our travel to Geneva and not come on our own? And now, I mean, that's not fully solved, still an issue, but also now we're talking about funding for refugee-led organizations with significant funding and, and millions of dollars. Um, so I wanna acknowledge that this has been done not only because of, again, our efforts on the refugee side, but also of, because of the true allyship of number of non-refugee-led organizations on the government side, the donor side, uh, the local civil society side. And I think I, this is really major of in movement building, right? It's like, how do we, how we center the lived experience in leadership, but also how the allyship uplifts 
really does not disempower in the name of empowering, which has been the kind of the tradition for 70 years, but actually uplift. And I would say that's why the mindset shifting that happened in philanthropy as a result of our constant demand, you know, on conversations and creating spaces for these conversations, I would say a number of donors have, we noticed in the last few years, have shifted their focus in, in, um, in funding to directly fund refugee leadership and to empower refugee leadership and to promote refugee leadership to the extent that you can think of like it's being a trend right now. It's like everyone talking about participation and like, you know, it's like, and I think it's, we are at that fine line of, you know, we've we've come a long way. How do we make sure that it's not a trend? And this is why I think in this point, accountability matters. You know, it's like diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So many people have take, have taken it on as box checking, right? Uh, and we see that in, in, in our own institutions and in cor corporations. And I think this is where we at with uh, refugee leadership and the promotion of refugee leadership and meaningful participation is that how much of it is symbolic box checking that makes you look good and how much of it is actually uprooting problematic systematic ways of working really shifting power and leadership and resources to the communities and I would say now if I make a statement and I write it again it would be okay how do we ensure accountability towards realizing refugee leadership and meaningful participation Thank you, Sana, for those excellent comments. Najiba, I'm interested in your thoughts on this progress as well. Um, Najiba, the Global Refugee-Led Network, along with its six regional chapters, has played a significant role in centering refugees in international and regional refugee responses. As it recorded in a report earlier this year, the network has helped debunk outdated and inaccurate assumptions that refugees are either too vulnerable unskilled or otherwise unable to participate in these decision-making processes. The network has also had some success in facilitating participation in high-level dialogues, such as in the annual tripartite consultations on resettlement, among others. How has the GRN worked strategically towards reform in this area? And how have you sought to engage with refugee communities around the Asia-Pacific region specifically? And what processes have been implemented to select refugee representatives for various regional and international dialogues? Sure, Tristan. It's it's a lot of questions, so I'm, I'm hoping I, I'll be able to cover as much as I can. I mean, it's so great to listen to Sana. She probably um, already mentioned, um, uh, you know, some of the real challenges that we've been facing through decades um, in ensuring that our voices are actually incorporated um, in policies that's really about us. I think uh, for a very long time, we've been trying to convey, you know, together um, around the principle, nothing about us without us, and that really talks uh, enough to it. Um, as you rightly mentioned, <clears throat> Tristan, as well as Sana, that in 2018, I think it was that the world really recognized that including refugees um, in designing and implementing global refugee response would really lead to a better and obviously more sustainable policies. So this idea was shrinked, as you mentioned, Tristan, in the G the Global Compacts on Refugees. So the, the conversation has instigated some progress, and I think that um, Sana was basically trying to go through it now. Uh, more than ever, we see refugees participating on panels, you know, being invited to fora, and, and you know, so that they are able to voice their interest. And importantly, there is um, a, a growing, you know, appreciation for the fact that including refugees in a substantive way is not uh, only the right thing to do, but it, that it results um, in policies and programs that are very much more effective, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and more legitimate, to be honest. But I need to say that despite this progress, the refugee response sector itself um, is still struggling to enable meaningful refugee participation. Um, and what do we actually mean by refugee-led uh, participation? Um, so as we can see, like, you know, responses and solutions to forced displacement uh, really uh, still remain uh, grossly inadequate. And if I look at the Asia region in particular, uh, we can see that 19 out of 52 states um, in our region here in Asia uh, are signatory to the 1951 convention uh, or the 1967 protocol. Um, and in 2019, only 0.4% of refugees in the region actually were able to um, you know, attain a durable solution. And this was um, obviously uh, noted um, you know, by the UNHCR Project Global Resettlement in 2021. So the capacity 
capacity of the humanitarian system itself is also severely constrained. In 2019, the UN Refugee Agency received only 50% of its budget requirement for its operation here in the Asia region. So that results, um, so, so the result is that most refugees in our region live in, prot in protracted displacement situation with few protection and little um, formal supports. So despite all of these challenges that myself or probably you heard also from Sana around, you know, engagement and participation, I need to say that still refugees are not perceived, uh, are not passive recipients of humanitarian assistance. But however, you know, we are and they are um, willing to be active agents of change. And I need to say this repeatedly over and over that wherever there are refugees, there are real people, um, you know, uh, with this knowledge, motivation and capabilities. You know, there are people within those refugee communities that are motivated, that have the skills, that have the knowledge, that have the capabilities um, to find solutions to the diverse challenges that we face or, um, in the world. In many countries, at least in our region, where we are working quite heavily through APNOR, the Asia Pacific Network of Refugees, you know, there are refugee-led initiatives that have been providing um, displaced communities with some access to education, health, uh, legal social support. And at the same time, you know, I need to say that many of these refugee-led initiatives that we work with across the Asia region are um, chronically under-resourced and receive very little support or recognition, you know, from other stakeholders uh, for their important work. So refugee representatives are left out of decision-making process, you know, despite all of the, you know, um, uh, achievements, the revolutionary change in refugee participation that we refer to, uh, I need to still say that, you know, there is still very little space to voices uh, of refugees and very little space for refugees to contribute to identification, to the design and implementation of solutions. Um, so although there has been, you know, recognition of the need for refugee participation, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the movement to include refugees in decision-making processes or as providers of protection um, uh, only gained very, very little momentum, uh, you know, because of the global compacts on refugees. Um, you know, to improve these responses, you know, to improve responses to forced displacement, we really need to look at how do we bring refugees at the table and how do we empower them to act? And obviously, um, you know, to give an example to that, the Global Refugee-Led Network, the GRN, um, as well as refugees state are doing an amazing work um, to do this you know they, they've been working very collectively you know to ensure that there is a level of uh, you know facilitation to to uh, there's a level of preparedness for refugees to engage into discussions so today i would say where uh, when more people are displaced by violence and conflict than any time since 1945 you know when public and political opinion on refugees is increasingly polarized and when the asylum system routinely fails many of whom we seek our protection the need you know, um, for refugee-led initiatives um, is way greater than ever. And um, for us, at least in facing those challenges, what we've done, you know, is that to look at how do we bring engagement by refugees at global level. And hence, you know, the establishment of a global refugee -led network became a platform, um, you know, to ensure that refugees are able to talk about the local, national and regional issues at the global level, to ensure that there is, you know, a platform for collaboration to work with other stakeholders, to, to invest in partnership, you know, with other INGOs, with other donors. Um, and, and, and if you look at this, you know, again, the pursuit of uh, meaningful refugee participation is obviously a foundational pillar to our work. And at least in our region, um, in the Asia region, you know, uh, we've been facilitating refugee participation through national summits, consultations. Um, I always reflect, uh, you know, when we held the first Asia Pacific Summit of Refugees, um, um, it was an innovative way of holding this summit. Um, and I clearly remember when I used to talk about digital participation back in 2018, for many sectors, Holds for many people around the world, the notion was unknown. You know, every time we wanted to talk about consulting people in the camp, they were saying, how would you do it? It's impossible. There's no internet access. People don't speak English. You know, when we talk to people about consulting, you know, people in Indonesia and Malaysia, but they can't travel. We cannot give them visa access. How do we bring them to Geneva? You know, how do we ensure that they're in New York? So all of these barriers to participation seemed an, imp a mission, an impossible mission um, for many stakeholders. But what we tried to do as part of APNOR, a refugee -led, the only refugee-led network in the Asia region, is to really uh, bring 
innovation to the way that they involve and consult uh, you know, uh, people and inform our policies. The Asia Pacific Summit of Refugees was a clear example of that. You know, we were able to connect um, to few, uh, to more than 10 countries across the region from Indonesia to Malaysia, to uh, Thailand, to Cook's Bazaar, to Iran, to Afghanistan, to New Zealand, to Australia, you know, um, by creating video hubs. You know, while we were having the main summit uh, in Bangkok, in Thailand with, you know, having in-person uh, summit with more than 70 refugees in the room, but simultaneously we were connected to other countries through digital participation where refugees and refugee experts and refugee-led organizations were connecting to us, uh, to the main summit in Bangkok and talking really about the challenges that they were facing in the region. You know, they were sharing their experiences, they were exchanging ideas for addressing displacement and this learning is unprecedented and the depth of human connection has been extraordinary, you know, across consultation the demands were obviously similar, namely, um, you know, refugee-led initiatives wanted to be included um, in the discussions where decisions were being made about their lives. And maybe if I can give you a second example is that when we wanted to work with the Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazaar, uh, for many said, you know, we've tried, we've attempted, it's not possible. There's no internet access, we cannot do it. We actually went again through some other innovative ways of engagement. You know, what we tried to do as a first stage of consultation is create a WhatsApp group. We start consulting people through voice messages in the WhatsApp group. We spoke for days around the needs, you know, and the demands uh, that the community had to bring, uh, uh, you know, as a regional conversation. You know, we spent um, weeks and months to ensure that the consultation is actually meaningful. We didn't go through ad hoc consultation and say, okay, there we are, you know, we're gonna start documenting your needs and we're gonna produce a report and then we're gonna start shining out there and create programs that doesn't necessarily fit your needs. So I think there are, there are real ways of, uh, you know, uh, engaging the communities, um, you know, and, and, and in, in an effort um, to move these limited examples sector-wide practice and create enabling uh, meaningful refugee participation within society at large. So I would like to end that, you know, in order to be able to promote full and active participation of refugees um, in all their diversity, I would say greater support should be given um, to refugee leadership uh, opportunities to enhance their representation in decision-making. And, and this really re requires investing resources in education, you know, skills development, whether it's mentorship, whether it's training for refugees to realize their full potential as leaders. It really um, requires the supported inclusion of refugees. Uh, again, something that Sana mentioned, you know, in planning, designing, and implementation of pro programs and policies. And I leave it there. Thank you, Tristan. Thanks, Tanjiba. And I'll turn to Mustafa now. Mustafa, in 2019, you became the first ever refugee advisor to the Canadian delegation at various UN meetings, including the inaugural Global Refugee Forum and Executive Committee meetings of UNHCR. What do you think was the significance and impact of this appointment? And beyond this, in your work with RCEAT, what progress has been made towards expanding the inclusion of refugees in high level international and national meetings? Sure. Um, so I was with the Canadian government on the GRF only, so it wasn't for XCOM, and, and uh, fortunately I wasn't for XCOM because the idea um, at this point, the process is that, you know, we open a revolving door for other refugees to be part of, you know, delegation and not kind of for the same person to be in. There was like a few things when, uh, for the year and a half before uh, the Canadian government agreed to um, have a refugee on the delegation. Um, at this point, there was a lot of work that, and I, I do echo Najiba and, and Sana in a way, is like we, we need to acknowledge that this work did not start only in, in 2016, 2015, start getting a lot of momentum around that time, but also there was a lot of advocacy and work that being done by uh, a refugee leaders and civil society, and I, I still one of the the, the picture that would never be erased out of my head actually in 2018 when there was um, an amazing woman from the Latin American group um, that really looked at us after the Global Refugee Summit and then she was telling all of us like now I can I can rest and then you know I'll, I'll pass the, the baton to you to continue on doing the advocacy um, in that sense but the same thing with the Canadian government we wanted to make sure that Again, it's a revolving door, it's a process, it's a structure. Um, and it's just kind of to show and lead by example, um, not only to have a refugee um, that has the uh, basically the space to influence states, 
um, uh, statements and position on refugee issues, but at the same time to be part of those bilateral meetings where states have with UNHCR or with other states um, and other stakeholders and just trying to have that perspective and bring that knowledge and work collaboratively uh, with everyone um, on this, but again, kind of with refugees uh, for the point. I think in, in terms of what, um, and again, I, I think uh, one of the main outcomes out of that participation with the Canadian government is that everyone get to realize that the sky did not fall and then there's nothing really serious happened. It was actually exactly the opposite. There was a lot of uh, a positive feedback came from the Minister of Immigration at this point from the Canadian government where they felt there was a lot of um, information and, and there was a lot of depth that was given. And, and I always want to give the example in terms of the, the, the minister at this point had a meeting with one of the other states and then they wanted to know really kind of a little bit more clear understanding of some of the refugee situations um, in different regions or in this states and compare it with Canada. And then while this information might take about three weeks uh, to be prepared, I was able through, again, the networks and the knowledge and the connections that I have on the ground, along with, you know, other colleagues, uh, to put in front of him literally kind of a one pager in less than 45 minutes to inform that meeting. And, and that resulted in much better outcomes um, in terms of the question. And I think the first really kind of aspect of the participation is that this is okay, it can happen, and actually it benefits. Uh, it's not only the right or the nice things to do, but it was there was a substantive uh, benefit coming out of having refugee to be, you know, to inform and be part of those delegations. I think the second step was like, how can we then now start making this more of a norm? And then how can we encourage other states? And I think in after the, the the Global Refugee Forum in June 2022, sorry, in June 2020, where the minister in the ATCR meeting at this point announced officially that Canada will not be um, participating in any in any delegation without having refugee on delegation. At that point, there was the creation of a structure, and then there was a body of other refugees, and then there was you know that kind of a door where refugees not only participate based on their um, lived experience, but also based on their expertise. So someone would go on to, with the Canadian government and ATCR that has an expertise in resettlement and some other, you know, going on XCOM that someone has a refugee, like basically expertise in international relations. So there was that kind of a structure that took a little bit of time. But then what was really uh, uh, powerful at this point is that we can go to other governments and say, because often it's much easier when you want to have a chat with government and tell them, Someone else did it that you're not doing something completely new. They don't freak out in that way. So the fact that we have a Canadian model um, and then we have a structure and a process and a trial, and not to say it was perfect or it is perfect, it's still a learning curve in that way, but at least there is something that we can build off. Um, and that obviously led to Germany um, and US. Uh, in 2021 to pilot and having refugee on delegation. I mean, but again, this also led most recently to creating a full on body in the US and, and US is um, basically the biggest donor, 40% uh, of UNCR donation or even kind of in the human trans sector. So to have a body that can influence and have a chat directly with a state like the, the United States of America um, and engage with those kind of conversations, very powerful. Germany, for the second time, also piloted that. We are in the process to create a body. Um, the exciting thing also was in New Zealand that you also, New Zealand created a body, the, the uh, New Zealand RAB, and, and, and that was kind of supported by the New Zealander government. Um, we are also in conversation right now with a few others. And also what you see, uh, what we've seen in the last XCOM, for the first time, we start saying, states start approaching us and say, you know what? We, we, we see there is a value in this. We actually need that. And we always want to go and talk to states now. States are realizing, but Najiba mentioned the struggle um, globally, for example, to UNCR, the, the fail in the system today in terms of resettlement or resourcing refugee organizations or even responding to needs. And, and that was shown in COVID. So obviously that system is failing, is struggling. And I think right now people are willing and, and, and more open to think of new solutions. And I think it's not really new solution. What better solution, the one that's been proven all the time where refugees have, have been always the first responders in so many uh, issues. And I think that, you know, in a way where we start seeing 
interesting in even XCOM Colombia, um, without any push, just thought, you know, put it in their statement. And then the representative of Colombia said already that they're going to actually move and suggest this for the uh, uh, Colombian government. You start seeing other states congratulating uh, states on, on, on including refugees. Even further than that, for the first time, um, there was a healthy competition between uh, Canada and the United States to give the space uh, or part of the statement to be delivered by the refugee advisor. And that's what we've seen um, kind of in, in XCOM recently, and also kind of getting involved and, and being in more bilateral meeting. Um, we start seeing the Kenyan government, the, the Uganda and others, so even from Global South start approaching and say, how can we build such a mechanism, acknowledging that we need you know, a new way of taking care of things. And this is where we always say, like just trying to build the value of that. It is a substantive thing to do. It is a useful thing to do. And it's just, you know, even though I feel it's a common sense, but I always feel the urge that we should continue repeating this, that participation is not the goal. That's not what we're looking for. It's not kind of the idea is like, here is a refugee, here is a participation space, we've done it, that's it. I think enhancing that global response is the end goal. And then we know that participation been proven, whether through studies or, or on the ground, that the absence of refugees as an equal partner or as a critical partners with other stakeholders, so it's not either or, is one of the main gaps toward the better responses. Um, so here we go, we just, you know, it's, it's, it's a growing, um, but I'll end with a point we know it's not perfect. I did see a question in the in the Q and A, and it was like, "What what did that result in? Um, and how do people see it on the ground?" Um, I'm fully aware that yes, people will not, and maybe would, they will not feel it on the ground. We, I'm fully aware that we still have a long way to go. It's a learning curve. It's it's kind of a midterm to long term um, aspect that we start seeing results of this because it is a learning curve for everyone for for refugees to. Uh, participate and 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 do things better, and then you know have that. I heard Sana at one point, like she was talking even in the past, always talking about it's it's not only enough with participation, but it's also about enabling those participations. So what we are in the process, I think, to enable those participations. Um, and states and other stakeholders are in the process to learn better and then do it not in a tokenistic way. I think it is being done in so many ways right now, still as a tokenistic. And then we will see more tokenistic approach to work participation. But then the idea is like, you know, I think until it gets to a space where um, it's a strong, it's enabled, then we can hopefully at that point start uh, getting some fruit and, and, and hopefully people feel a little bit kind of the difference and responses out of the whole system. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mustafa. Fiona, I'll turn to you now. Mustafa is interested to some extent, has expressed to some extent how governments are responding to and engaging with these developments. From your perspective, what has prompted the New Zealand government to work towards the meaningful engagement of refugees in its decision-making processes? And at the governmental level, what work has been done towards this goal to date? And what do you believe is the ultimate end goal for the government in this space, both domestically and internationally? Thank you, Tristan. And kia ora from Wellington, uh, New Zealand. And uh, welcome to everybody who's managed to join us today. Um, I'd just like to give a little bit of, um, of a discussion about what we are doing in New Zealand here. Um, for New Zealand, we really recognise the importance of engaging with refugee communities and working uh, in collaboration with them on policies that impact them. And we believe that moving towards meaningful participation is key to improving the systems and policies that impact the outcomes for former refugees and in Aotearoa. Recently, New Zealand has established uh, a refugee advisory panel, which uh, Mustafa just uh, alluded to earlier, and we worked with our seat on the establishment of that panel. And the aim of that panel is to provide refugees in New Zealand with a mechanism to participate in the development of refugee settlement strategies and policies across government in an effective and meaningful manner. And um, we've also been doing a whole lot of work to uh, give effect to refugees lived experiences and the design of implementation of policies and other work that we have been reviewing here in New Zealand. And some of those examples include the use of a co-design model to implement policy changes to our refugee family support category here, um, community participation in the development of our community organisation refugee sponsorship programme and inclusion of former refugees as part of relevant procurement panels and processes. For example, we recently uh, retended all our uh, 
uh, resettlement provider locations, and we included former refugees on the panel as part of that procurement process. So I'll just talk in maybe a little bit more detail about some of those things I've just mentioned. And the first is the um, New Zealand Refugee Advisory Panel. And that panel has been established to provide former refugees in New Zealand with a mechanism and the ability to engage and have a voice on matters that directly affect refugee communities. Um, the establishment of the panel enhances refugee participation in New Zealand, which is one of the key outcomes of New Zealand refugee resettlement strategy. The purpose of the panel is to provide former refugees with an opportunity to participate in the development of refugee settlement strategies and policies in an effective and meaningful manner. It's to ensure former refugee interests, perspectives and knowledge inform and influence strategic direction and policies on regional, national and international refugee issues. Include former refugees in relevant New Zealand government delegations in refugee-related multilateral settings, so the sorts of things Mustafa was talking about earlier. And so in July 2022, so it's very new for us, um, but we are nine members from a diverse cross-section of New Zealand's refugee community community were appointed to the inaugural panel and panel members will serve for two years. The panelists are currently working on development in their governance structure and work program and the selection of the refugees uh, when selection panel for who went on to the panel was from a really diverse cross section of um, NGOs, iwi leaders and New Zealand uh, government as well. So the aim was to get a really broad cross section of people involved in that panel and on that panel. Um, in terms of a couple of other things that we are doing, um, we have recently redesigned our refugee family support category and we used a selection of former refugees who either have had direct experience sponsoring family members under that category or who were sponsored themselves in a co-design process to influence changes to the way the category is processed and designed. So we really wanted to get lived experience and voices so that we could improve and run a much better refugee family support category. We're also rolling out a pilot of our community organisation refugee uh, support program and again once again former refugees were part of the co-design process for the development of that program um, and they're also represented on the panel that reviews the sponsor of applications as well as the monitoring and evaluation advisory group. Um, civil society groups run by former refugees have been encouraged to apply to become approved sponsor groups and being supported with the application process um, as part of that program and we so far have seven refugee led organisations that have been approved sponsors since that program started. And finally I'd just like to give a quick mention to the uh, work we're doing at the moment on the refresh of New Zealand's uh, refugee resettlement strategy which we're currently uh, refreshing. So far over 2,500 people have participated in face-to-face -face sessions, online consultation and co-design workshops this year. So these uh, insights will actually inform the strategy as it goes forward. So that's just a little insight to the work we're doing here in New Zealand. Um, we absolutely recognise the criticality and um, we couldn't do our work without former refugee communities. That's the only way that we're actually going to be able to have a system that's effective and meaningful and that's going to work. So I'll hand back to you, Tristan. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I have some questions now for Sana Mustafa and Najiba. There has been clearly there's been some significant attention to the issue of meaningful refugee participation in recent years. Yet, as you've kind of already flagged, the path towards catalyzing refugee participation remains complicated. Um, to what extent are other stakeholders supportive of these systemic shifts? In which areas do you think there is resistance, and why do you think that is the case? And what further reforms do you think are necessary to enhance meaning? for refugee participation going forward. And, and in reflecting on these questions, it'd be great if you could also kind of engage with some of the excellent questions that have been posted in the Q&A, uh, which deal with issues such as accountability, um, levels of engagement in different levels of governance, um, specific support for uh, diverse communities such as LGBTIQ plus communities, et cetera. Um, Sana, perhaps I'll turn to you first. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Tristan, for the question. Um, I think there are a number of barriers and that's still, you know, like ongoing in terms of this movement of really realizing refugee leadership, not only, you know, part promoting participation. Um, and I think one of the major barriers we face, and I would talk about the barriers actually within the forcibly displaced communities ourselves and also within allies and then like as a movement. Um, I think within forcibly displaced communities, one of one of the main barriers that we are facing is that 
you know, our ability to collaborate and work together, um, considering the level of trauma and survival that most of us still live in. And so it's so hard, you know, it's like when you are in a survival, uh, in, in a state of survival for decades or as of recently, and considering that most of forcibly displaced persons have experienced and continue to experience ongoing traumas and without access to mental health and support and without access to just self-preserve any resources around self-preservation um i mean all of that results in um, and manifest in our ways of working in our ability to work together and really push for shared goals and, and agendas and i think that's not only in the refugee rights movement and leadership movement that's across movements in black rights movement and women rights movement i mean in in movements where it's it's led by people who've been oppressed systematically for decades it's, there's always so much um, trauma and survival that really kind of surfaces and um, manifest in, in, in our sometimes inability to work together or like, you know, recognizing like why this is important or not. So I want to recognize that. And of course, that all comes back to resources. And when we say, when we say resources, it's not only as organizations having receiving funding but it's also as us as an individuals having rights and being well sustained and resourced that we can participate mentally and physically in 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 this and in in, in movement building and when you are as an individual in survival mode financially for decades it does not help in movement building so we cannot you know we cannot even like acknowledge that without acknowledging that it's systematic when you're deprived from your rights and resources. So of course, you're gonna continue to be in survival and trauma mode. So of course, the, that's what manifest in the movement building. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that from our from the end of the movement side uh, of refugee communities. I think from that, all that being said, where I see a resistance right now as well is really from those who have been part of the refugee response sector for since it's, Incipation, like since the UNHCR convention, maybe, um, their inability to give up power. They have been centered around this. This whole sector has it's a it's an industrial complex, right? I mean, it's an industrial complex, and it's their job. This is also survival for them. I mean, one of the major questions I get from major institutions and allies when we talk about refugee inclusion is that does it mean I'm going to lose my job? And so, and it's a, it's an okay question to ask, but it's just a clear indicator that yes, it is a job. No one saving anyone here. It's transactional, and let's just acknowledge that. And yes, you have you are worried about your job because the system put you in a place has been designed, and and you've leveraged that and obviously benefited from that. And like in the name of empowering people, you are receiving this this position, and you are in this position of power. But at the same time, you're actually not empowering people. I mean, until now, we basically have camps without access to basic rights. After 70, over 70 years of the same actors receiving billions of dollars. And so how on earth would I be convinced that it's not conflict of interest, actually, for them to be doing this kind of work? Because if, if I am empowered, then they could be out of jobs. And this is exactly what we're debating right now, that resistance of like, how can I shift, give up power? What does what does it mean for me? What does inclusion means for me as an ally and non-refugee? Non, non, non and I think, again, these are questions that I, my invitation always to allies is that we should acknowledge them. I mean, it's like no one wants to address the elephant in the room. It's like when we talk about racism, right? And anti-racism work is like, no one wants to address says anything in the room. It's like everyone has the best intentions, but it's not about intentions. It's about impact. And so acknowledging where this is coming from, I first, I think it's very important to acknowledge the roots, the colonial roots um, of our sector and, and how they still manifest in the day to day. And then acknowledging that regardless of your best intentions as an ally, you have benefited from this. You, and in a way or another, you have decentered power from the people, then can we talk about now how can we do it differently? Like this is a chance for change. This is a chance for reconciliation, for shifting power. And I think that my message always is that 
everyone has a role. The local civil society organization, they have a role that they only them can play. Only them can know the government laws and engaging in certain advocacy. And NHCR has a role and governments have, donor governments have a role and academia has a, have a role. It's not about that. It's about how you do it how you do it equitably and in a way it's, digni it's dignifying and it's truly shifting power and how you do it in a way that is with the people that's and it's with lived experience and centering lived experience in it and so that's my invitation towards the resistance and the fear of survival from the allies about what does inclusion refugee leadership mean to me thanks sana najiba i'll turn to you to reflect on what you see as the main barriers as well no, I mean, uh, maybe in addition to what Sana has already mentioned, I think uh, we are now at a stage where we think um, there are more um, engagement from the wider stakeholders when it comes to refugee participation. Um, I feel like there's so much of conversation being built um, collectively that uh, people are now claiming they know what refugee participation is about. You know, they're recognizing, you know, when we talk about refugee participation, they can just quickly say, oh, we got it now. We understand, you know, since the Global Compacts on Refugees, you know, we've made certain pledges to ensure that refugees are included and they participate. But then when you actually Really go deep down those conversations there is very there is very little understanding of exactly what refugee participation means you know we're still um, struggling in some areas of our work to actually talk about what refugee participation is or why we actually need to be included whereas you know our focus should be really about how do we uh, you know uh, implement refugee participation how do we ensure that refugees engagement is meaningful and at least um you know uh, in the past uh, couple of years uh, the to the communities that we work, uh, that we talk and we work with, and many of those uh, tell us that as much as we've had, you know, a revolutionary change in the way refugees are being engaged, but then tokenistic practices have also increased. You know, there is much more space for tokenism because now, you know, we, we've built that conversation and dialogue around, uh, you know, meaningful refugee engagement, refugee participation being important. And, and, and it, so we've created that space and we've created that evidence, you know, and now it's really the stakeholders and others coming through and saying, okay, we understand it now. So can you resource us so that we can implement refugee participation? But the reality is that they haven't. We still see refugee participation being often limited to very much ad hoc consultations. We talk to refugees saying that, you know, they're only included in consultations, you know, in the last moment without any information, without, you know, providing a providing them with, you know, ongoing feedback um, as a result of those consultations, you know. Um, so there's still very little ongoing access to spaces where decisions are being made. You know, at the same time, you know, um, when it comes to global engagements in particular, you know, we talk to refugee leaders, refugee experts, that they're still being victimized. Um, and considered, you know, uh, for their only knowledge being uh, their refugee journey. You know, uh, they still recognize uh, refugees, you know, with lived experience, but the only expertise and solution that they're bringing to those discussions is their personal journey, whereas it is not the case, you know, refugees can actually be equal co-developers to the solutions that we're discussing. Um, and, and, and in looking at that, like, you know, I can go back to an example, having worked with Mustafa and other colleagues during the ATCR process, the annual tripartite consultation on resettlement, one thing that we realized that's quite important is how do we facilitate refugees' preparedness to engage in decision-making moments. You know, uh, it's so important that they are actually positioned and prepared as equal partners. And to do that, you know, we actually require, um, you know, uh, uh, we require to create certain opportunities, whether it is trainings, whether it is mentorship, whether it's employment opportunities, whether it is funding for professional developments, all of those are important, but it doesn't exist in today's world. So if we talk about refugee participation, that's not there. And probably my last point very quickly, I couldn't agree more with Sana when it comes to power dynamics. Uh, we're really sitting at an era where it's so difficult to dismantle the power dynamic that exists. You know, it's so important for institutions to self-reflect around their policies and process and procedures uh, in, in, uh, and reflect on, their, uh, on the way that their systems have been excluding refugees. You know, meaningful refugee participation doesn't happen as a matter of common practice. You know, we need predominant institutions like the UNHCR, for instance, like the national or international civil societies or the donor community to really reflect on their systems. Uh, and, you know, this, this requires, they, they need to be identified, you know, change in the internal practice and take that leadership to do that. And obviously with that, 
that financing is way more important, which uh, I'm not going to talk about it considering San and Mustafa has talked. And if you look at it right now, you know, refugee participation, to what extent um, I can say that 90, uh, I'll rephrase, 95 percent of refugees are still working under a voluntary capacity. You talk to all of the RLOs, we're just doing a research with Act for Peace, you know, which Tristan is also involved, conducting a refugee-led research across four countries in Thailand, in, Bar uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and um, uh, uh, Bangladesh. Um, to every RLO that we've spoken through this research, each and every one of them is telling us that financial is a gateway to their participation. Each and every one of those organizations tell us how they are not having enough access to financing, you know, how they don't have access to donors, you know, they don't have opportunities to fund for their core costs, to compensate for their time, for their expertise, and they're being engaged into very ad hoc processes of being, you know, involved in different committees, different boards, different researches without actually being incentivized uh, or provided a, a stipend or incentive or, uh, you know, compensation for their time. So, in reality, when we look at this, we are still tokenizing refugees, and we still require so many more processes and, and, and so, uh, so many more steps to prevent tokenizing refugees. And to do that, we really need to commit and working in partnership with refugees. To do that, we really need to invest um, in refugee leadership and refugee uh, participation. And to do that, we really need to be able to make space uh, for and amplifying refugee voices. And lastly, to be able to work uh, you know, towards the fulfillment of their rights, whether it's education, whether it's livelihood, whether it's um, you know, uh, access to safety, whether it's durable solution and so on. Thank you. Thanks, Najiba. And I, I would just like to add that one of the things that I think is striking in relation to the resourcing of refugee-led initiatives, and I think this goes to the points relating to power asymmetries and also accountability, is that it's largely been provided by private sector philanthropy so far, rather than through the traditional, you know, financial structures through the humanitarian mechanisms, whether it's through UNHCR or other bodies or governments to date. Um, so I think that's interesting to reflect upon in relation to that. Um, Mustafa, I'll turn to you in terms of what you see as the kind of barriers and next steps in relation to refugee participation. I think Sana and Najiba said it all. So uh, the, 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 only, the only thing just, you know, uh, the only point I would add, uh, when we engage with a lot of stakeholders, I think the idea, that perspective of, you know, the, the field of we're being threat is that does that mean we're going to lose our jobs or does that mean we're going to get less uh, uh, resources in in that sense and and actually in honesty is more than I don't think the threat here and it's funny sometimes I feel that we have to um, somehow comfort a lot of those stakeholders where we're trying to say is like we're we're not asking for a seat or for a space for refugees to be replaced with you know a space that exists or a seat that exists. Um, we're just adding to add that extra space and to add that extra seat um, because the space can handle actually more and, and, and it, it, it is unfortunate at the same time, it's, it's a fact. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, we're talking about over, you know, 100 million and, and this number, I mean, what are the most common uh, um, sentence right now you hear in every single time about refugees, unprecedented number, everyone's talking with this right now. Um, and it's, it's, it's never kind of a lesson all of that. So it's keep on growing and then the space do um, <clears throat> need more stakeholders and in particular refugees to be part of those responses. I think really the real threat here is that those who have been doing the same thing for the last year and then Senna mentioned them in the same way without any impact, um, now they can be called out on those uh, mistreatment uh, of the position and the power and then, you know, the fund and the resources that they have. And it is a concern that we hear. I mean, you can you can definitely see it when a UNCR getting, um, you know, merely 50% of the funding. So part of it is, you know, capacity, but but at the same time, even, you know, we, we, We've been hearing about kind of it's a it's, it's a money issue, but then we we've known in in few crises recently that money is not an issue as a political one. And then one of the things in about kind of really um, the decline in funding to NCR is that you would know there are concerns coming from states and other donors in terms of like what kind of impact that we're seeing. I mean, not only UNCR and others. And I think now it, the the idea is that um, what I mentioned in the beginning, how can you do this? 
How can we do things better? I think it just kind of fits. There is no time and, and, and there is no any uh, capacity to agree or accept anyone doing the job in, in somewhere that very critical, that affecting people's lives, that actually causing life and death in some areas to do their jobs just in okay and in a way is like we're doing a humanity work and then we're doing the work. I think the inclusion of refugees right now is not to take anyone's uh, space. Again, just kind of to improve responses, but at the same time, to um, make those mistreatments stand out and then being known by others in a way that will create um, a more healthy competition in terms of doing the work um, in the best way possible. Um, I think moving forward, it's just, again, it, it, it is just the idea that how can we learn this and how can we do it better? Uh, we have a new um, member uh, at the table right now, and 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 it is the member that is a more the most passionate, the most connected to the cause, who are refugees themselves. How can we utilize that member and instead of start fighting each other and then building those kind of competition? But how can we come together collectively and do our best to improve or enhance a little bit of those responses? Um, I don't think we're going to do it in, in in a way that's enough, but at least do it in a way that's a bit better. Thanks, Mustafa. And if I turn to you, Fiona, from your standpoint, can you tell us about some of the challenges, opportunities, and next steps for Immigration New Zealand in pursuing these exciting reforms? What advice would you give to agencies and stakeholders considering the same pursuit? Thanks, Tristan. Um, I think the most important thing that we have learned is building enduring relationships with communities um, and that we need to provide the right supports for refugees who are coming to New Zealand so that they are able to meaningfully and effectively participate um, in our society and, and in our decision making. Um, so that's got to be real and genuine and authentic and I think there's no other way to do that other than those things. Um, so I guess the development of a <clears throat> excuse me, highly participative refugee voice in agencies is welcome and we're involving refugees as I talked about earlier in our policy development, our policy making um, and also in the use of our um, general frameworks for how we're operating, how we're connecting and communicating across. I'd also like to note that um, there was a discussion about financial support and the criticality of that before too. In terms of the um, establishment of the Refugee Advisory Panel here in New Zealand, we're actually funding an academic institution as the Secretariat so they actually have the funding themselves to determine how that's used and how they build that panel and how that panel is supported. So we're trying to make sure that it really is a truly independent voice that can provide feedback into government and work really effectively with decision makers. Um, I would say we haven't got it perfect, we've got a long way to go. Um, it's historically engagement probably has, hasn't been as good as it should have been and certainly uh, COVID has, has a real impact on us for being able to connect. You know, in New Zealand we were in um, long lockdowns and we weren't able to travel and we weren't able to get out to communities. So that's something that we're working really hard to try and rebuild that trust and engagement with communities um, and be able to really hear their voice. So then that's part of the way that we've been approaching the uh, refresh of the refugee strategy as well, really being on the ground in communities, listening, being a part of that, hearing what communities have to say and how they want to be, how they want to be engaged with. And I think that's for us our next steps. How do we really engage effectively? How do we listen? How do people participate and how do we continue to grow and improve what we doing in this space so thanks Tristan. Thanks Fiona and we're almost out of time but I just want to throw to Sana quickly just to just to respond to one question that's come through which relates to kind of the role of allies and the question is how can allies NGOs and governments ensure that formal processes and traditional spaces of power and, and tra are trauma-informed and culturally safe for forcibly displaced peoples and refugee-led organizations? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Thanks for the question. And I think um, the detailed answer you can find it on our website, um, asylumaccess.org. And then there's a document we published, a toolkit actually, it's called uh, Building Equitable Partnerships Guidelines. And it literally talks about how could the how could the spaces and the partnership that's created between two actors that have so much power dynamics be trauma informed and what are the steps for them these spaces and partnerships to be more equitable and we talk in details about that in that document about the need for internal change especially from like the government's ngos in their equity journey of the things that and the trainings they need to provide to their staff and not the traditional trainings that you know the field training no we're talking about like 
uprooting racism, internalized white dominant oppression culture trainings for the people have to go through to unlearn and to be aware and then to learn how we can engage and have collaborations and interactions on a personal and interpersonal level. And then that organically transforms into how we engage with our partners and with the people outside. And so everyone wants a magical answer. And I'm always like, there's the magical answer is that you need to start within. It's an internal change and it's an internal cultural shift um, that translates into policies and, and then translates into partnerships. And so that document um, really has detailed answer for that. And one, uh, one question that was asked, I want to say about how can we ensure diverse, how do we, I think it was like, how do we ensure diversity within the refugee representation and that people, it's not the same people, the same individuals and gatekeeping. And I think it's an excellent question, right? Because, you know, so many, in so many cases, like, and then again, like the, the oppressed in a way, in, a, in an intentional way or not, you know, exercise the same, you know, oppression that was exercised on them. And that's like, just like as a result of so many things. And so I want to say one of the major ways that we found to be helpful in the resourcing refugee leadership initiative to ensure inclusion of all different refugees and to not gatekeep and to ensure that there is representation in the spokesperson and who has access to what is setting up governance structures. This is matters like setting up, you know, investing times in agreeing on ways of working and investing in uh, de uh, designing decision making and then decide designing you know, what do you want to call, whatever you want to call them, processes or agree, community agreements about how we identify who's going to go to this opportunity, what time, what time we give, what language we give. I mean, all of those governance questions are really, when you said inclusion requires documentation, requires communication, requires time and resources and information. And if we do not invest in that, it will be the same. The easiest person, the easiest thing to do is to invite Senna to speak. You know, but then like if there is like processes and if there are things that we internally have set up that it doesn't, it's not my decision. It's not one person decision of who come and who shares. It's it's there's a governance that we all have to follow. And that governance is designed in an inclusion lens and grounded in the equity value. Then I think I found it. And in our experience, we found it one of the best ways to mitigate gatekeeping within the movement itself as well. Thank you, Sana. And I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for their robust discussion today. Uh, it's been amazing to hear from all of you in relation to this important topic. And thank you also to everyone who's commented in, in the Q&A uh, with very thoughtful and nuanced questions. Um, clearly, there's much to discuss, and we hope to be able to engage with them as we go forward over the coming months and years. Um, We've unfortunately run out of time, um, but I'd just like to point everyone's attention to the next session that will be taking place at the Cattle Center, Center Conference, um, which is on, is Ukraine a turning point for people seeking safety? Um, because we're all coming from different time zones, I won't mention the Sydney time zone, which is 6, well, I will mention it, 6.30 p.m., but it's essentially eight and a half hours from now that, that this will take place wherever you are in the world. Um, and we hope we can join, you can join us then for the next session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you.